Did Pontius Pilate write a report to the Roman Emperor Tiberius concerning Jesus, encompassing his miracles, trial, crucifixion and resurrection? Does this report contain amazing details not even found in the Gospels? Also, what does the Pilate Stone discovered at the archaeological site of Caesarea Maritima in 1961 AD tell us about Jesus' crucifixion? That's what we're talking about today, so let's begin. A document exists known as the Acts of Pilate. It was first contained in an apocryphal book, the Acts of Peter and Paul, said to be written in the first century. But it was included intact as an earlier original document, supposedly from Pilate himself. It was also then included in a 4th century apocryphal book, the Gospel of Nicodemus. But is it a factual account or a factual account that was embellished a little by Christians or totally fabricated? Scholars are divided. Some ancient writers believe that Pilate did send such a report, and it makes some sense. As in the report, Pilate indicates that Herod Octopus was speaking badly of Pilate to Caesar, and Pilate wanted to defend himself before the emperor. That is a logical reason to have written a report. And one must ask if anyone fabricating a report would have added a detail like this. It really seems unlikely. In AD 138, Justin Martyr, the early church father, wrote to Roman Emperor Antonius Pius and referred him to Pilate's report. These exact words. This exact report, this is a key piece of evidence. Obviously, the report was common knowledge in and around 150 AD and was preserved in the imperial archives in Rome in order for the Emperor Pius to have been able to have read it. Here is part of what Justin Martyr wrote to Caesar. And after he was crucified, those who crucified him cast lots for his garments and divided them among themselves to make them more satisfied. Then another church father, Tertullian, relayed an account that Tiberius Caesar even tried to have Jesus added to the Roman Partion of Gods, based on Pilate's report. Now, whether that's true or not, we don't know. There is no record of it in the Roman archives, but it does show that at least early Christians held the acts of Pilate in high regard. Not only did Christians hold it in high regard, but the enemies of the cross did as well. Pontius Pilate's letter to Emperor Tiberius serves as a crucial historical artifact, shedding light on the events surrounding Jesus Christ's crucifixion. Its significance is underscored by the efforts of Emperor Maximin in AD 311, who orchestrated a counterfeit version of these acts, aiming to undermine Christianity's influence. This manipulative tactic suggests the profound impact the original acts of Pilate had within the Empire. By delving into this document through a series of episodes, analyzing Pilate's words and providing commentary, we aim to offer insight into this pivotal moment in history. Join us on this journey by subscribing to our series, ensuring you don't miss a single episode. We commence with the opening lines of Pilate's letter to Emperor Tiberius. Pontius Pilate to the Emperor Tiberius. Greeting. Recent events in my province have been of such a character that I thought I would give the details as they have occurred, as I should not be surprised in the course of time. They may change the destiny of our nation, for it seems of late that the gods have ceased to be propitious. I am almost ready to say, cursed be the day that I seceded. Valerius Gratus in the government of Judea. It seemed to me of all conquered cities, Jerusalem was the most difficult to govern. So turbulent were the people that I lived in momentary dread of an insurrection. To suppress it, I had but a single centurion and a handful of soldiers. I requested a reinforcement from the prefect of Syria, who informed me that he had scarcely troops sufficient to defend his own province. An in-state thirst for conquest. To extend our empire beyond the means of defending it, I fear, will be the means of destroying our noble empire. Those were the words of Pontius Pilate. Pause and reflect on the significance of this passage. Pilate's communication to Caesar suggests a startling revelation. Jerusalem's defense rested upon a single centurion within his cohort, typically comprised of only a hundred soldiers. Valerius Gratus, 
the predecessor of Pontius Pilate, expressed his frustrations with governing Judea. He considered Jerusalem to be exceptionally difficult to govern due to the turbulent nature of its people. This sets the stage for Pilate's subsequent account of the precarious situation he inherited. Pilate's account reveals the inadequacy of military resources for maintaining order in Jerusalem. Despite the city's potential for unrest, he had only a single centurion and a handful of soldiers. This shortage of troops highlights the precariousness of Roman control in the region and the challenges of quelling potential uprisings. The document also alludes to the broader context of imperial overextension. Pilate expresses concern about the empire's unsustainable expansion beyond its capacity to defend its territories. This hints at the strain on Roman resources and the potential ramifications for the empire's stability. Pilate's apprehensions about the consequences of overextension and the inadequacy of military resources foreshadow the events that unfold later in the narrative. These concerns likely play a significant role in Pilate's decision-making process, including his handling of Jesus' trial and crucifixion. As we delve deeper into the document, we will uncover how this shortage of troops played a pivotal role in Pilate's decision to order the crucifixion of Jesus. Now let's get back to Pilate's words. Among the various rumors that came to my ears, there was one that attracted my attention. In particular, a young man, it was said, had appeared in Galilee preaching with a noble unction, a new law in the name of the gods that had sent him. At first, I was apprehensive about his design to stir up the people against the Romans, but soon my fears were dispelled. Jesus of Nazareth spake rather as a friend of the Romans than of the Jews. One day, in passing by the place of Silo, where there was a great concourse of people, I observed in the midst of the group a young man who was leaning against a tree. Calmly addressing the multitude, I was told it was Jesus. This I could easily have suspected. So great was the difference between him and those who were listening to him. His golden-colored hair and beard gave to his appearance a celestial aspect. He appeared to be about thirty years of age. Never have I seen a sweeter or more serene countenance. What a contrast between him and his hearers, with their black beards and tawny complexion. Okay, we need to comment on this as well because I believe this is the only recorded explanation of Jesus' appearance in all historical documents. This particular interest is the description of him as having blonde hair and a beard. The inclusion of this detail raises questions about its authenticity. Was it an addition made by later scribes copying the document? Or did Jesus indeed have lighter colored hair and beard compared to his contemporaries? My guess is it's an add-on by those who copied this document over the years, but we don't know. It's certainly intriguing. Now back to Pilate. Unwilling to interrupt him by my presence, I continued my walk, but signified to my secretary to join the group and listen. My secretary's name was Manolus. He was the grandson of the chief of the conspirators who encamped in Etruria, waiting. Catalina Manolus was an ancient inhabitant of Judea and well acquainted with the Hebrew language. He was devoted to me and worthy of my confidence. On entering the Praetorium, I found Manolus, who related to me the words that Jesus had pronounced at Silo. Never have I heard in the Pedico nor in the works of the philosophers anything that can compare to the maximums of Jesus. One of the rebellious Jews so numerous in Jerusalem. Having asked him if it was lawful to give tribute to Caesar, Jesus replied, Render unto Caesar the things which belong to Caesar and unto God the things that are God's. It was on account of the wisdom of this saying that I granted so much liberty to the Nazarene for it was in my power to have him arrested and exiled to Pontius. But this would have been contrary to the justice which has always characterized the Romans. The man was neither seditious nor rebellious. I extended to him my protection unknown, perhaps to himself. He was at liberty to act, to speak, to assemble and address the people, and to choose disciples unrestrained by any praetorian mandate. But this unlimited freedom granted to Jesus provoked the Jews, not the poor, 
but the rich and powerful. It is true that Jesus was severe on the latter, and this was a political reason, in my opinion, not to control the liberty of the Nazarene scribes and Pharisees. He would say to them, You are a race of vipers. You resemble painted sepulchers. At other times, he would sneer at the proud alms of the publican, telling him, The might of the poor widow is more precious in the sight of God. New complaints were daily made at the Praetorium against the insolence of Jesus. I was even informed that some misfortune would befall him, that it would not be the first time that Jerusalem had stoned those who called themselves prophets, and that if the Praetorium refused justice, an appeal would be made to Caesar. However, my conduct was approved by the Senate, and I was promised a reinforcement after the termination of the Parthian War. Being too weak to suppress a sedition, I resolved upon adopting a measure that promised to establish the tranquility of the city without subjecting the Praetorium to humiliating concession. This indicates that Pilate hesitated to crucify Jesus, opting instead to hand him over to quell the political unrest of the time and prevent potential uprisings. Now, let's delve into some artifacts associated with Pilate and examine what they reveal about the death of Jesus. What does the Pilate Stone say about Jesus' crucifixion? The Pilate Stone, also known as the Pilate Inscription, is an ancient artifact discovered in 1961 near Caesarea Maritima in Israel. It is a dedicatory inscription on a limestone block and is significant because it provides archaeological evidence of the existence of Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea who is mentioned in the New Testament accounts of Jesus' trial and crucifixion. The inscription on the Pilate stone reads, To the divine Augusti, this Tiberium, Pontius Pilate, Prefectus Judaea. Translated, it means, To the divine Augusti, this Tiberium, Pontius Pilate, Prefect of Judea. Caesarea Maritima is located along the Mediterranean coast of Israel. Caesarea Maritima was a significant ancient city and administrative center during Roman times. The stone was found reused in a staircase leading up to a theater at the site. It was identified by archaeologists due to the Latin inscription carved into the limestone block. If you made it this far, we say thanks for staying, and let's hear about what you think about the Acts of Pilate, whether it's legit or not. Stay tuned. Bye.